idea of individual and the social session one organized by the Department of Philosophy, Dunbarstow College, Tura. At the outset, I, on behalf of Philosophy Department, take this privilege to express a warm welcome to our two distinguished guests and esteemed speakers, Dr. Prasenthi Biswas, as Chief Professor of Philosophy Department, Northeastern Hill University, Shillong, and Sir Anish Chakravati, Assistant Professor of Philosophy Department, Kamala Nehru College, hey. University of Delhi. A big welcome to you, dear professors, and thank you for accepting our invitation to be the resource persons of the session one of the webinar series. I extend my warm welcome to the principal of our college, Reverend Father Bevan Rodrick Smukin, who is always there to inspire, to motivate, and to support us, uh, to support us in every endeavor that the department aims and undertakes. I also welcome the vice principal of our college, Reverend Father Avilash Vijay, into our miss, and also thank him for support. Last but not least, I welcome my professors, teachers, friends, students, colleagues, and all the registered participants from different states of the country and from abroad as well into this first session of our webinar series on the idea of individual and the social. Now I will proceed to speak briefly about the theme of this webinar series. The theme of the webinar series is on the idea of the individual and the social. Under this theme, we will try to cover a broad spectrum of areas, and we will be organizing this series at a regular interval of time in the future academic sessions. The purpose of this webinar series is to unpack a variety of concepts, arguments, and frameworks that fall within the idea as stated herein. Further, the aim of this webinar series is to arrive at a noble concept of the individual and the social and the points of convergence in any topical thematic that speakers choose to Now, could you please, uh, dear participants, please... An individual is a basic functional and constituent unit of any human system, be it a family, society, any social or political institution, or even a civilization. An individual as a being or as an active agency can be seen from various perspectives, such as the religious, spiritual, psychological, political, and the social. But the question that can be asked or wonder upon is what does it mean to be a member of a community as an individual or to belong to the society in which you live? In response to such philosophical questions, philosophers propose theories about what ought to be the case. In contrast, social scientists describe what is the case. Social and political philosophy like ethics is a normative pursuit and a conception of what constitute moral Actions for individuals is integral to how they relate to the community, the largest social group to which they belong. A conception of the good and equality is central to understanding what makes a society just or fair for its members. As we look at how specific philosophers view, view the relationship of the individual to the society and what makes a society good, it can be noticed that a particular conception of human nature will underlie theories on the relationship between individuals and the society, be it a local look, be it a local community or a nation. The theme reminds us of ancient Greek philosophers, namely Plato, who in his magnum opus, The Republic said, all, all social changes comes from comes for the better from the passions of the individuals. And his student Aristotle later in his work, Politics, stated that man by nature is a social animal. An individual who is unsocial naturally and not accidentally is either beneath or notice or more than human. Society is something that precedes the individual. The investigation on the relationship between the individual and the social has been a subject of scrutiny and knowledge since the dawn of the civilizations 
whether in Western or Eastern, ancient, medieval, or modern societies. So today's distinguished speakers will throw some light on interesting questions and issues concerning the welfare of the individual, that is to say, we, self, and its macroscopic aspects and development at larger level, levels of social political realms. Unless, unless there is a harmony and proper interaction between the individual and the social scenario where the individual is placed, there cannot be any move towards prosperity or any promising utopia. Keeping this in mind, today's speakers will enlighten us with issues concerning the benefits of suspension of judgment and its benefit in the form of mental equanimity and tran tranquility at the individual level to the concern of the social welfare and meaning via the discussion on the ethno-philosophy of the tribal thoughts of Northeast India. I am sure today's session will leave <clears throat> a lasting impression in us to know and deliberate upon the idea of the individual and the social and will naturally push, uh, naturally push us towards mutual goodness and towards a harmonious community bonding between the individuals and the society. Now I request the, I request the principal of our college, Reverend Father Vivan Mukim to deliver his inaugural address and to launch the webinar series. Well, over to you, Father. Thank you, Dr. Awantai Japang. A very good afternoon to everyone. On behalf of Don Bosco College Tura, I would like to welcome each and every one of you to the webinar series organized by the Department of Philosophy, Don Bosco College Tura. As, as I welcome each and every one of you to the webinar series, part one, I would like to express my sincere words of gratitude to all those who made this webinar possible. I place on record my sincere thanks to the Department of Philosophy, Don Bosco College Tura. I would like to mention the name of Dr. Wan Pai Mary K. Japang, the Assistant Professor, Department of Philosophy, and the convener of the webinar. For the last few days, Dr. Wan Pai has not been keeping well, and in spite of her ill health, she is able to be present today to see that this webinar go on as planned by the department. I would like also to place on record my sincere thanks to the faculty members of the Department of Philosophy, Don Bosco College Tura, to Ms. Frianki M. Marak and Mr. Ferik Salnam, the assistant professors, Don Bosco College uh, Department of Philosophy, to the other faculty members, and most importantly, to the students of the department who are also involved in helping the department to organize this webinar series. I place on sincere record my special thanks to the resource persons, Mr. Anish Chakravarti, Assistant Professor, Department of Philosophy, Kamala Nehru College under the University of Delhi, and Dr. Prasenjit Biswas, the Associate Professor, Department of Philosophy, Northeastern Hill University, Shillong. Thank you for accepting to be the resource person at this webinar series. I would like to thank them specially for encouraging our staff members to organize the webinar. A big thank you for sharing your expertise with us. I would like to express my sincere thanks to the technical team of the college, particularly to Sri John Satish and Mr. Javelin A. Sangma, who made all the arrangement for this webinar. To all those who have lent their hands and support, I would like to say a big thank you. Don Bosco College is situated in a hill town of Tura in the western part of the state of Meghalaya. The college was established by the Silesians of Don Bosco in 1987 to serve the cause of higher education for the people of Garo Hills, and in particular to Northeast India in general. The college during the time of the lockdown due to COVID-19, particularly last year, 2020, have organized a number of webinars as well as an international web conference spanning to almost two days with almost 1,700 participants and more than 50 papers presented. During this lockdown period, 
it has made all of us to change the way we look into our learning teaching experience. And the purpose of this webinar series that is organized by the Department of Philosophy is to create awareness on the participants on the Indian and in particular, the Northeast or even the tribal ethos. May we learn to appreciate the culture we have and to love the culture of others. I take this opportunity to welcome all the participants, those who are attending through Zoom or through our YouTube link. Thank you for registering for this webinar. Once again, welcome to the resource person. Welcome to the faculty members of the Department of Philosophy, Don Bosco College, to other faculty members of the college and to all the participants. As we take part in this webinar on the idea of individual and the social, let us be strengthened to recommit ourselves to build the social fabric of our country. Thank you and have a wonderful learning. Dr. Wan Pai, kindly unmute yes, yourself. Father. Thank you so much, Father. Thank you so much, Father, for your inspiring words and for always being uh, there for us. Uh, now, before I uh, call uh, Sir Anish Chakraborty to present his uh, paper, I will just like to give a brief introduction about Sir Anish. Sir Anish, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Yes, I'm here. Now, before I call Sir Anish, I would just like to give a brief introduction about Sir Anish. Uh, Mr. Anish Chakravarti is working as an assistant professor of philosophy at Kamala Nehru College, University of Delhi, and is on the verge of submitting his doctoral dissertation on the topic, The Logic of Epistemic Justification and Agyan Vada, or Ancient Indian Agnosticism from the Department of Philosophy, University of Delhi. He has previously been a visiting scholar at the Department of Philosophy, Heidel Heidelberg, University, Germany. He has also been the recipient of various academic awards, including the Indian Philosophical Congress Medal from the University of Delhi. His academic research interests and publications are in the fields of philosophy of religion, epistemology, metaphysics, aesthetics, and ethics. His recent publication, publications include the paper God Neither Loves Nor Hates Anyone at the Proceedings of the 23rd World Congress of Philosophy in cooperation with the Greek Philosophical Society, a chapter on utilitarianism for the book title, title Understanding Ethics, Macmillan, Limited, Macmillan India Limited, and recently a chapter titled Sanjay and Mahavir from Agnosticism to Pluralism for the book Quietism, Quietism, Agnosticism and Mysticism, Mapping the Philosophical Discourse of the East and the West, published by Springer, Singapore, 2021. Oh. So Anish, welcome and please take over. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wanfai. Uh, just want to confirm if I'm audible. Yes. All right. All right. So thank you so much. Uh, I think uh, I would really like to, first of all, thank uh, uh, you for, you know, giving me this opportunity to uh, present and, uh, uh, you know, allow me to give my ideas and uh, thoughts today uh, in the form of a resource person in this webinar. Uh, indeed, I have, I'm feeling very good and it's an immense feeling of pleasure and honor to share my, share this platform, you know, with uh, Professor Prasenjit Biswas. Uh, hello, sir. Uh, it's uh, really a, a delightful feeling to be here with you. Uh, before I begin, I would also like to uh, thank the respected principal, you know, Father Roderick Yusmuk him uh, for being behind this uh, webinar in every manner, for being the advisor as well as the patron for this seminar. Also, uh, I would like to uh, thank 
uh, Deekan Minda, of course, Dr. Vanfai, thank you for being so kind and helpful throughout the organization of this webinar for every of our timely response and a very smooth coordination for this webinar with me. And also I would like to thank the other department members involved for this organization and everybody who is involved for this, uh, you know, uh, organization of this webinar and especially the participants for coming here. So uh, I'm really thankful, thank you. So uh, now moving on, uh, as uh, I would like to share my screen uh, so that I think uh, easier for me to present what I want to. I'll just share my screen. Uh, is the screen visible? Yes, we can see it. Yeah, it's visible. All right, okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. So uh, the topic, as you uh, uh, heard, is uh, you know the topic that I'm going to talk on is on the ataractic virtue in Pyrrhonism and Agyanavad. Uh, well, uh, I would like to say that the, it's in my topic. If you see, has three main terms. One is the ataractic virtue. Another is the term Pyrrhonism, and the third word is Agyanavad. To uh, elucidate this, I would like to tell you that my topic is basically going to push or focus on explaining the philosophies of the ancient Greek philosopher Pyrrho, who was contemporary of Aristotle, and, and would try to show what was, what was his teaching, what was the school, Pyrrhonism, which followed after him, had mainly to teach, okay? And this I would explain in the form of ataractic virtue. I'll explain what is ataractic, which actually, actually has come from the word ataractia. And also, I would like to relate this Greek philosophical school with an Indian philosophical school, a very lesser known Indian philosophical school called Agyana or Agyanavad, uh, which perhaps in English generally is translated as agnosticism. Now, uh, my, aim, my aim is to explain the ataractic virtue as it is in Greek and a similar virtue concept given in Agyanavad and would like to compare and relate the two from a philosophical perspective as well as from a historical perspective. So this is my aim of the lecture. So to begin with, uh, you know, we have to first understand the word Pyrrho because he's not really a very mainstream line thinker. So we need to know uh, who he was. And uh, so uh, if you see, he was, uh, you know, he was an ancient Greek philosopher and he was contemporary to Aristotle who, uh, you know, accompanied Alexander the Great in his expeditions towards the East, which finally ended in India. So if you know history, Alexander the Great was into, you know, his, his uh, expedition towards the East to control the world and he had a big empire. Pyrrho was one of the philosophers who accompanied Alexander the Great and came till India. And then he returned back. So Alexander died on the way, but Pyrrho managed to reach back to Greece. Also, uh, you know, after he returned back, he kind of founded a school, which we call it as today as Peronism in English, or Peronian skepticism. And it began, of course, the school started, or the thought, or the teachings of Peron. After he went back to Greece from India and to the Middle East area, he propagated a philosophy which originated around his time, which was 4th century BC. And oh. Can so, Mr. Anish, could I interrupt you a little bit? Yes, yes. Uh, I will just announce uh, to the participants that if you have any question, you can post your question in a Zoom and YouTube uh, chat section. If you have any question to the uh, speaker, to the first speaker, uh, first speaker, you can post your questions to, you can post the questions in the YouTube and chat, uh, sorry. YouTube and Zoom chat section. Okay, thank you, Sir Anish. You can continue. Okay, okay, thank you. So, uh, you know, so as I was telling you, that Pyrrho basically started his philosophy preaching what he called as Pyrrhonian skepticism in the fourth century BC, and the thought continued till third century AD, which was almost more than 700 years. And it kind of terminated, the school kind of terminated with the Roman philosopher called Sextus Empiricus. 
so the school uh, of the, this school of thought is generally falling in the timeline of a little later greek philosophical tradition and it also uh, generally uh, is not the main streamline school but it has its very uh, you know beneficial philosophy there were many philosophers which came in between sextus empiricus and pyrrho for your general knowledge or, and for your research you can see so it, the school started with pyrrho of elis but it, uh, then the next few thinkers were timon Nosiphenes, Hecatius of Abdera, Heraclides of Tarentum, Anaxidemus, Agrippa the Skeptic, Theodas of Laodicea, Menodotus of Nicomedia, Herodotus of Tarsus, and finally Sextus Empiricus. So, if you see, there was a huge line lineage of thought that continued of this school. This was briefly about the history of the school, and uh, now I would move on. to talk about pyrrho so pyrrho has been depicted in a lot of artworks and of course books and then you just see how he looked like perhaps this is how he looked i don't know but apparently he looked like this and uh, this is what is one of those most famous uh, pictures and paintings but moving on to the philosophy of pyrrho pyrrho was initially you know a student of democritus and had also some influence from the epicurean and the stoic philosophy of the time which was propagating however after his expedition to the east especially which concluded in india and when he went back he kind of proposed his philosophy which largely has been considered as a sort of agnosticism or skeptic philosophy and uh, his philosophy was based on three main philosophical questions he has said to have recorded these three questions which we thought are very important and significant for any philosophical concern the first is how are pragmata that is the ethical social political metaphysical cosmological matters that means matters which concerns our human life are by nature so what is the nature of our ethical matters social political matters metaphysical and cosmological matters what is the nature of that the second question which he asked was what attitude should we have towards these matters and the third question that he asked was what will be the outcome for those who have this attitude so pyrrho's philosophy is very clearly main talking about the world about the scenario in which we are that is our ethical social political even natural cosmological metaphysical makeups in which we live what are they like what is the nature of them and secondly how should we deal with these issues which are encircling with us all the time and the third is what should be the attitude or outcome that he suggest will give us what attitude should we have we will now understand in due course of time so i hope the questions are clear and if you see these three question encapsulate not just the metaphysics but also the epistemology and the ethics concerned with the philosophical topic or the philosophical approach he had taken so moving on to the next uh, slide he gave uh, you know there are there's lot to read about pero and there's lot to uh, you know discuss on pero through the lineage of peronism but briefly you know in this talk uh, that much as time i have i would like to present and explain his basic structure of philosophy and what is a dialectic virtue which he writes that so the first question students which was about oh, sorry i'm sorry i'm being students sorry <laughs> uh, and uh, you know the first question is basically answer that all pragmata all the issues that we actually face or see in life should have the i approach of adiaphora adiaphora uh, which is translated or represented as undifferentiated by logic that means matters are you should not be logically differentiated as higher or lower so peru say that firstly what should we understand by all the political ethical metaphysical cosmological basis of understanding is that we should understand or to have the idea of adiaphora adiaphora is basically a method method of method or approach of understanding everything from our perspective of knowledge logic experience but should not be inclined you shouldn't be inclined to keep on differentiating what you learn in your thought or at least or majorly in your judgment so the approach pero suggest is to be having an office, to be an investigator he says that you know people philosophers are team in either accepting things or rejecting things 
but I am an investigator. I am investigating. So he says to have we have an investigating outlook. One should follow Adya Pora. That is try not to judge. It's not that he's not saying that you shouldn't analyze things, analyze, but don't judge things or conclude things to be differentiated into higher or lower. First, investigate them. The second question that he says was that what should be the attitude towards the nature of things? He says that the attitude that we should have is, answer is the word he uses, epoche. Epoche is basically the view of the, the suspension of judgment as in English we translate it as. So he says that if, when you see the universe, when you see the world, when you see the place in which you live in, where you're dealing with, where, where you look up in the sky, where you look up to the biological nature of the world, animals, plants, where you see interpersonal connections between people, you see social structures, political structures, why you observe and a part of all that, why you live your life, what should be your approach? You should investigate things, but you should not hold a judgment. You should not conclude any judgments or opinions finally about it. And why one should do that, we will talk about it. So he says, what should be our attitude towards living a life as an individual and its relation to the social is that you should suspend judgments and follow the procedure of epoche. And he gives a systematic six-fold or a five-fold method to do that. And he says that you can achieve suspension of judgment uh, through those six folds of method. Now, what is suspension of judgment? We should understand it. Suspension of judgment is where while we do not conclude any opinion, any knowledge, or any judgment about something. We withhold that. The point is not to not investigate or learn or discuss or to you know, ponder about something. The point is not to arrive at the conclusion. For, for, for one share, one, one you know, step short of concluding something out of your investigation. Keep it into your mind and keep your journey continuing. So uh, the method that he suggests has certain six-fold approaches, which he uh, thinks will be helpful for one to follow the idea of suspension of judgment. So first we can see he suggested the asthamita. The Astamita uh, Mita is a concept which suggests that you know all the matters that we see generally, we have to understand are ultimately unstable and not measurable with certainty. So the uh, the uh, Astamitatic approach is basically that you know we have to understand somehow. We have to understand at the basic original position that matters that we see in the world generally through our experience, through our logical understanding, we find them to be unstable. And we can't measure them with certainty through its you know, pros and cons in an exact manner. The second thing that he asks us to focus on and investigate and realize is the concept of anaprikrita. Anaprikrita uh, is a Greek word which means that all the matters that you're dealing with, whether it's ethical, social, political, cosmological, natural, metaphysical, are ultimately unfixed and undecidable. So how do we see that? Well, we see that through our understanding that we find many people are actually uh, you know, holding one view, another is holding another view. Each one of them are using their own you know, frameworks to have their own opinions. Also, we see with time, things are changing, knowledge changes, our approaches and our understanding of things changes. So we have to believe and take this idea that we must be a little undecided about things rather than being too quick to decide. And this approach of Asthamita and, uh, you know, Asthamita and Anapitrita allows us to have the idea of adoxastoi. Adoxastoi is the third approach where basically we have an anti-doxa or anti-dogmatic approach. So once you have the following of the first two, where we are taking things as not being certain and you don't take things to be undecided, you ultimately don't hold views you don't become a dogma, you don't hold a dogma, or you don't practice doxa. And he says, therefore, you are easily able to abandon doxa. Now, what are the, the you know, the demerits of holding a doxa or a dogma or opinions or beliefs too readily? We will be discussing shortly. So, Peru says that if you will follow the first two methods, you will be able to follow the doxa or the dogma, uh, you know, abandonment of the doxa or the dogma in a better manner. 
And the next step is, is the of the aclinis. Aclinis is the approach of uninclined towards the view of the of this view or view on that matter. So uh, aclinis is basically when you are seeing so many opinions, when belief system, so many belief system and opinions, knowledge claim, we are not in mental level are inclined to move towards one view or to another because we are without views. We are at present without views. And finally, the last one is the Akrad and Toy. The Akrad and Toy term is the practice of refusal, okay, of having a suspension to choose any opinion on any matter. So once you actually follow these five steps, you come up to the Akrad and Toy, which is the lack of acceptance or withholdment of choosing an opinion. So the aspect of choice is not your aspect of your personality. You are not exercising the aspect of choice of choosing an ideology anymore. And this is what defines the suspension of judgment completely. So, uh, you know, please, we must understand that this approach is a experiential, cognitive, and a thoughtful practicing approach that's given by Peru. And Peru says, the third question that was it, what do we get out of this? What is the benefit that we get out of doing all this? He says the benefit that we get out of doing all this called ataraxia or what we call as ataractic virtue, which in Greek is roughly translated as somebody who is mentally unperturbed, who is into tranquility and mental equanimity. In due course of the slides, we will understand what is the meaning of that, okay? Uh, uh, you know, because uh, the idea of mental equanimity is somebody who is not happy or is pleased towards some sort of pleasure and neither is somebody who is moving towards sadness or depression or some sort of negative emotion that one can bring or state of being that one can bring. It is a state in between the two where you are bracketing out an extreme form of some sort of happiness, eudaimonia or pleasure Neither you are becoming a negative or a pessimistic person to hold something negative, but you are absolutely neutral, calm, and collected. That is the ataractic state. Now, uh, Anathidemus, you know, another Peronian thinker after Peru, gave 10 modes to explain and to give up the idea as to why uh, Peru suggested the uh, a suspension of judgment. Why he thought that it is better to have a good life with, uh, with suspension of judgment than to have that. And, uh, you know, Agrippa, uh, Anastimus, you know, Anastimus who came after Perot argued 10 reasons to suggest that why perhaps we should not hold judgments and in which way we can perhaps achieve ataractic virtue, okay, the mental equanimity. So uh, uh, Anastimus, who was a later Peronist, argued that why we suspend judgment is because we see the different animals for this different means of perception. So we also are animals and along that all species of animals hold different means of perception because their body, their makeup, their life, their experiences are different. Second, Anastasia says that even different perceptions are seen among different individual human beings. Different individual beings have different perceptions to see things. So it's very, of course, very obvious to think and know that different people will hold based on their subjective their facticity, will they hold different perceptions? So most of the perceptions or beliefs or ideas that people carry are coming from their makeup rather than their original thought. The third point that Anastimus made was that for the, same, for the same human being, what happens is information perceived with senses and thoughts keep changing and sometimes become self-contradictory. So as we have been living, we are all becoming, you know, experienced as we are living in our life. We know that we, within our own framework also, what we thought before, we change or improve upon what we are now. So our own senses, our experiences of our life, our thoughts, our methods of thinking keep changing. And sometimes to the level that they become self-contradictory. That says what we thought before in our life and thought to be true or the best way, perhaps change in later and become contradictory later to your own self and you change your attitude. So, you, so what you think today perhaps may change again. So it's better to have a pocket. The next point that Anastasia says is the knowledge perceived becomes unreliable from time to time with physical changes. 
so as far as the knowledge of the lived realities of the world is concerned knowledge changes and are unreliable students may uh, sorry i'm so sorry i'm having to thing students in the teams uh, participants uh, you know uh, we see that people also change with time the way a person is with you right now you hold a judgment about him or her the in future that person may not be the same as you as what you thought to be today so persons also change with time things in the nature also change with time the change may be slow and subtle but it changes with time so we should be very wary and conscious of holding opinions and value judgments once with that because what is the trouble when we hold judgments believes it with it comes action and when action comes and it is not well thought out it leads to lot of problem it could lead to lot of ethical you know uh, uh, disengagements next point that he made is that objects are known only indirectly through the medium of language air etc well anastasius in the line of pyrrho argued that what we know actually in the world is always through a medium either we are using language as the medium to know something in the physical nature of the world we are always having the medium of air it has an obstruction so if i'm looking up at a star i know there is atmosphere in between through which i'm looking at the star similarly when i'm trying to communicate to people there is language in between while i'm talking to you know or or trying to know anything there is some medium in between though medium is auxiliary but it makes things indirect so anastasius has argued that again we should hold judgments before we hold anything to be very dogmatically to be true or false or of a particular nature because we may be actually because we are knowing things indirectly so our approach should not be holding a judgment about them rather just investigation the next point which is the seventh point says that these things in nature are in a condition of constant variation in color temperature size and motion so of course this is quite a twisted point i already explained that things are changing with times and uh, you know this idea has been borrowed a little bit from heraclitus also there has been a push or a influence on peronian thinking from uh, you know heraclitus who also believed that the idea of change is the reality so pyrrho and anaximenes and many other thinkers took a little bit of inspiration from heraclitian philosophy as well finally the next point is all perceptions therefore appear relative and seem interact on upon another so what happens is that all perceptions that we have ultimately are relative because each one has their own approaches to look into the matter but that doesn't mean that we have to nullify knowledge they are not suggesting to nullify knowledge all they are saying is don't judge or make a judgment of the knowledge that you have so we you then you will see that many things are relative and many things are interacting with one another there is a dynamism or becoming involved in knowledge all the time so therefore one should be wary of holding fixed judgment which is more of a sort of a beam or fixating or freezing any idea and lastly he says uh, you know uh, our impressions are influenced with up to our upbringing traditions and custom now most of us what we think to be true false right wrong uh, you know ultimate reality is very much strongly coming from our upbringing from our genealogical uh, you know uh, birth and development the traditions and customs are having a huge influence on our personality either positively or negatively so making judgments and thinking that we're objectively making judgments based on that is problematic and finally he says that we're also within different beliefs of under different laws and social and political conditions so there is a strong strong sense of push in our society to have certain ideologies or belief system based on our social political conditions so we because of these things we should be wary and should not hold judgment so anastasius showed a very practical social political biological and you know psychological reasons to withhold judgment and to have hypocrisy now why we have to do all this is because we want to achieve attractia yeah. moving on you know another uh, uh, thinker called agrippa agrippa was a you know later greek philosopher from the same school of pyrrhonism he also gave his five modes to explain that why we should suspend judgment and you know he gave the idea of dissent he gave the idea of he was more logical in his approach and he showed problems with the structure of the arguments that we have the beliefs that we carry how we justify them there is problem more there according to agrippa so he instead of showing psychological biological facticity issues he shows rather logical issues concerning and problems when we talk about 
holding judgment. So he says that we have issues of relation, assumption, circularity, which, under, which does not allow us to, you know, hold judgment. So he says that uncertainty is demonstrated by differences of opinions among philosophers and people in general. You will see as many people, as many opinions. Demonstration of your experience, of your, you know, uh, cognitive uh, exposure shows you that there is a thing called dissent in all philosophers. All philosophers who have even deeply investigated into the nature of reality, all thinkers, all great minds, yet have difference of opinion. So Agrippa said we cannot, it's too big an, too big an evidence to avoid. So he says the dissent is very big reality. So we should not party to that. And we should be very cautious of holding judgments like they are holding. We should have a meta approach, a one step back approach to look into this. The second thing that he said was, that we always have progress at infinitum. That means whatever whatever we believe and whatever proof we want to give out of that belief, they also need proof and it goes on till infinity and it leads to a regress argument. So participants, whatever we believe, okay, whatever we think uh, today, we may have justifications of that, but we will keep on having justification, requirement of some sort of justification always according to Agrippa. Even if we believe in self-evident truths, they are either assumptions, beliefs, non-tested beliefs, or they require further justification. The third thing is, he says is, all things are changed as their relations become changed, or as we look upon them from different points of view. Our perspectives, our frame of references to look at things are different. We are born at different points of time. We are born in different situations, different, uh, different societies, different class, different economical structures, different climate, different influences from our family and society and religion. So therefore the relationships become very diverse of each individual. And that's why we see from one person having a certain kind of an upbringing or influence becomes a certain kind of person and the other becomes other. So we know there is a some sort of training or backing that comes and it makes us to realize that relation changes as different points of view happen of different people based on their environment. Third is assumption. The truth is that it is based on an unsupported assumption. So if we try to get rid of a regress argument, we are ending up in assumption. So if we say we can keep on giving justification, but if we say we can't give justification, if we, you know, if we say we can't give some sort of a thing which we don't need to justify further, we go on to prob add infinite justification, which is a problem. And if we say, that there is some truth which is self-evident, then this is an assumption according to Agrippa, because even that could some way be challenged as modern, you know, skeptics like in the argument of the brain in the vat or the argument of the devil given later by Descartes or, you know, the idea of the dream argument. These are enough arguments to at least problematize the self-evident truths that are there. And finally, Agrippa holds that there is also a problem of circularity. Most of the proofs that we gave are actually already assuming what they are proving. So Agrippa said that, you know, that apart from Anastimus, who hold various, you know, uh, uh, pragmatic and practical reasons to withhold judgment, Agrippa suggested logical difficulties in holding judgment. So we just can't be followers and mere believers. We should be authentic to know why we believe what we believe. And he says, keeping these five more being in down, what is more authentic state of being? To suspend judgments and not to hold beliefs readily. Moving on further, I would like want to tell you the what is a didactic virtue now. So if you if you follow Peronian philosophy in your life, in your belief system, which is not about believing anything. So it's not a school which is like any other school of thought, which suggests you to have a particular metaphysics or a meta particular belief system. It's rather only has an approach. And if they say if you have an approach and keep on investigating and learning all philosophy and still go keep on your search, you achieve a state called ataractic virtue or ataraxia. So I read to explain what it is. Ataraxic is an even-minded mental state or dispositional tendency towards all experiences or objects, regardless of their effective balance. Say, for example, pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral source. Here I use the word term even mindedness in its common definition as a state of being calm, stable, and composed. Equanimity also involves a level of impartiality, that is, being not partial or biased. 
and neutrality such that one can experience unpleasant thoughts or emotions without repressing denying judging or having aversion for them similarly in a state of equanimity one can have pleasant or rewarding experiences without becoming over excited like maniatic or hypomaniatic or trying to prolong these experiences or becoming addicted to them a mental experience that is neither pleasant nor unpleasant that involves neither intensifying nor dampening your current mental states is what is attractive attractive pertains to both our cognitive logical and psychological disposition so it's a state of complete peace and tranquility where you're absolutely free from any biases and you're ready to live your life moving on there is uh, this painting you know i would like to conclude peronian philosophy and quickly move to abhyanuvad uh, by you know showing this painting by a 16th century german painter you know petrarca meister he shows here if you can see the painting there is a ship uh, the painting is called piro in a stormy sea now piro is a philosopher he is here if you can see the cursor piro is sitting here on the right hand side you know of you will see uh, the people sitting calmly there is a storm going on and the ship is sailing by through but all the other people in the ship are very worried tense you know distressed fearing death fearing harm fearing uh, you know all sorts of difficulties but piro is sitting calmly of course it's a romanticized uh, you know expression of peronian uh, wisdom and achieving ataractic virtue because if somebody is fearing you know in the stormy sea why he is fearing because somewhere cognitively cognitively or psychologically the person believes that they will die and secondly that they believe death is bad now these are also judgments so piro perhaps is free from that he doesn't think that he doesn't think anything to hold anything as final judgments so he is calmly sitting in the ship sailing through even if it is in a storm so this is just a uh, you know a romantic representation of peronian philosophy by later european thinkers now moving on to indian philosophical school of agyanavad which also kind of were like peronian school held or believed that we should hold we should withhold judgments and knowledge rather than holding beliefs and knowledge this school of philosophy is very lesser known in indian philosophical circles very less research has happened and very less resources are available to us about it so agyanavad is a, uh, you know actually means somebody who is ignorant or is agnostic agnostic is somebody who holds that we cannot hold anything to be true or false so agyanika was a name given to certain sects of ancient shramana tradition just to tell you in ancient india there was a, a movement of thinkers or people called the shramana shramana people were ancient indians who basically you know uh, believed uh, to wander from forest to forest and from region to region as hermits as ascetics in search of knowledge so this movement arose in 7th 6th century bce in india and there were certain sects called the agyanika or the agyanavadins who also traveled and did not believe or did not uh, you know they did not held any opinion they did not denied any opinion they neither affirmed or denied any opinion they even admitted that they neither affirmed or denied any opinion they were absolutely free from any kind of opinions or denial of opinions or anything so this was their approach and they moved from uh, Well, you know, uh, from forest to forest, from villages to village, in terms of wisdom. So, Agyan thinkers question the belief and knowledge of all orthodox think schools in ancient India. It is quite likely that the label Agyan or Agyanika was given to them by rival schools. In a, see, the word Agyan generally, okay, in Sanskrit or Hindi, is not a very positive word. In Indian philosophy, the word Agyan is meaning nations or ignorance, which is generally seen as the root cause of all problems. So rival schools, because they did not hold any opinions, okay, or rival other schools like Buddhism, Jainism, Nyaya, and other schools of Indian philosophy wanted to term them as Agyanika or Agyanavadin, which is kind of a slightly abusive term to give to them. You can see in the picture there are some representations of the heretical Agyan thinkers or other sort of thinkers who are shown in a quite you know negative light in this picture. If you can see. and here there is a picture where they is showing buddha to be calm however the agyana thinkers or other skeptical thinkers to be critical and not nice moving on agyana philosophy you know could successfully suspend all judgments without coming to any committing to any position whatsoever even when suspension of judgment itself was taken to be as a belief or an ideology 
So unlike Adhyana, uh, you know, the uh, other people, they believe that suspension of judgment is the way of life. And this should not be taken as a belief or an ideology because this should be seen as a method. If you take suspension of judgment as a belief or an ideology, it becomes even then as a philosophy to practice in a dogmatic manner. So agnostic did not claim that any conclusive knowledge about any one of the matters debated by the philosophers is possible or impossible. They didn't make any claim. For purposes of argument, they developed a technique of systematic evasion, but generally they appear to have deprecated argument as leading to bad tempers or loss of peace of mind. Instead, they seem to have advocated friendship and in being non-rival. They seem to have taught that the various kinds of ideologies, beliefs, or their denial were not consistent with each other, say, beliefs or nature of the soul. Such speculations could only be confusing and harmful or lead to harmful actions. So they believe that if you hold belief systems, you are creating problems. In fact, when you don't believe, you don't create rivalry and you live in harmony. And they thought that, you know, holding beliefs is, and then trying to maintain harmony among each other is much more a titanic task than to actually suspend belief and then live in harmony. And, you know, at the time of Buddha and Mahavir, uh, there was a most famous teacher called Sanjay Bilati Buddha, whom I'm working on my PhD as well, was the most well-known proponent of that thinking in historical record. Moving on, you know, there is a systematic which is called uh, by me as Amar Kathan Nilamban in Sanskrit, which basically, you know, what they did was they believed that in your tetralemma form, you can hold all knowledge can be discussed as is, either you hold it as is not, and you as either you hold it as is and is not, or you say that neither it is this nor it is that. So you have four sorts of judgment that you give on knowledge. This was also adopted later by Buddhists. This strategy of tetralemma was adopted by Buddhists later on and also by Jaina in their sevenfold uh, predicative uh, you know, uh, methodology of Saptabhangi Nair. So what did Ajnanavadins do? Ajnanavadins said that knowledge can be judged or proposed in four ways. Either you affirm it, either you deny it, either you do both or you do neither. And to all these four forms of judgments, they responded in a five-fold manner to it, which we call it as Panchakoti or Pentalemma. So what did they say? That they said that to each of these judgments, no matter what they are, they held that we do not say that we hold any general opinion about anything. We do not say, or I do not say that I hold any particular opinion about anything. I do not say otherwise. That is, I do not hold anything above than other than general or particular opinion. I do not deny any opinion. So when I'm saying I'm not holding any general opinion, some may think, oh, are you denying it? No, they say we don't deny it also. We are not even denying any opinion. And finally, we do not even say that it is not of not, or we do not deny that we deny any opinion. So anytime where you catch, try to catch hold of them by saying, oh, you are trying to say that, they would say, no, we are not even doing that. So they kept on slipping away from any kind of judgment that you postulated to them. So Buddhists call them like a slippery fish. Buddhists, ancient Buddhists call Ajnanavadins as a slippery fish because try the moment you try to hold them and catch them in their thoughts, they slip like a fish. So uh, they had uh, this very systematic method where I don't have enough time to discuss about it. Moving on, there were four known schools of Ajnanavad, which Hello. we haven't recorded uh, history. Sir, sir, yes, yes. I please interrupt you. You can yes, yes. explain. You can explain. You can take your time. Okay. All right. All right. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. How much can, time can I take, uh, Dr. Van Pai? Huh? How much time? You can How? Uh, continue. Yeah. So I will... Okay. Yeah, you can continue and explain. Okay, please let me know if I'm exceeding the time limits. All Thank right. You. Yeah, okay. okay. So, uh, uh, so I can take the liberty of seeing me a little easily. I hope the lecture is making sense and it's interesting in some sort or the other. Uh, so coming back now, in the recorded history, we find four schools at least in the Ajnanavada tradition, in the ancient Indian tradition, where, where they suspended judgments. Now, broadly, all these schools were put together because they all are holding judgment. They don't want to give any judgment about any reality. But within their, within their school or their, uh, you know, their, uh, their Ajnana uh, approach, they have four 
sub approaches or variate variations within it. And uh, these four variations that we see again suspension of judgment are based on the reason for why they suspended judgment. Okay, so just like in Peronism, we find various reasons, but they didn't. The school there didn't divide into various forms. Rather, it continued in one philosopher after another. In the Indian tradition of where uh, thinkers were suspending judgments, the school divided into four parts, as it is recorded in the Jain and Buddhist scriptures. We have nothing about them. In fact, uh, participants, we should know that we know nothing about the Agnanika from their original text. But there are two reasons for this. Firstly, because of course, the material, whatever they taught is lost, and therefore the only reason or way that we know about them is through the other schools scripture, the scriptures of other religion and thoughts and disciplines that were there. So, uh, you know, so that's one reason that's why we don't have any scripture of them. And uh, we know much very little about them. And the second reason for why we don't know so much about them as an original source is that you can see that, that their philosophy is such, you know, their methodology is such that you wouldn't find a lot of content in their philosophy because this philosophy is content free, directionless free. It has no, it has no content to tell you about. Like other philosophies might want to tell you what is the nature of the soul, what are the different kinds of soul. What is the, you know, what is, uh, how soul is like here, they are forget about describing anything. They're not even judging anything first in the first place, because it's a, it's a philosophy of freedom an absolute way of life rather than holding beliefs. So, so this school was seen to be dividing into four subsections by later scholars and the Jenin and the Buddhist thinkers. The first school, if you see, Avoided intellectual debates and friction that they create as ideological beliefs are mostly irreconcilable, irreconcilable due to privation of knowledge. Now, what did the first school say? The first school said that because of the intellectual debates that we see, there is never a time when you don't see intellectual debate. It's not that the intellectual debate is a problem. It's not even that, that it should not be, it is not good. It could be very good. But what should be our approach as a meta philosophical thinker, we should know that no matter what we believe today, we will have a friction of ideas along with others. So the first school suggested that they most of the time because of our subjective influences and your knowledge or wherever you come from, you hold certain beliefs of knowledge with certain ideology, especially in philosophical and religious knowledge. What you do, you find friction. So most of the time it is happening because of privation of knowledge. We are somewhere, you know, our knowledge is private. And when we try to make it public or objective, it leads to friction issues. And therefore we avoid doing that. And therefore we suspend judgment. So we want to get rid of intellectual friction, which could be cognitively harmful. And we listen to everybody. We listen to everybody. We listen to ideas without believing them. So the point is not okay to reject the uh, debates. The point is to do debates without believing them. Point to discuss ideas and views without believing them. That is what the first school suggested. So the discourse of philosophical debating and learning is not questioned. What is questioned is the, the, the believing and following it. Finally concluding it that this is the ultimate. That is what should not be there. You should keep on walking the path rather than going to the destination. Second school, on the other hand, was slightly different from the first school of Agyanavad. It said that to avoid holding any view because what one believes today may be disbelieved in future, that may lead us to be guilty about our past. So it is better to entertain the view ex externally without accepting it or rejecting it. So what did the second school suggest? It? Second school suggested that we should suspend judgments and achieve ataractive virtue or mental equanimity. Why? Because if we hold uh, judgments, we would rather be in, uh, you know, uh, we'll, we will be actually disregarding our own ways of learning. Because what we hold today, we know that we may be disbelieving in future. So what we believe 10 years back today, imagine that what we believed and thought and was seeing the world through our eyes 10 years back, we are not seeing the world like that today. And in future, we will also not be what we are today. We will change. We will see things differently. So what we believe today, we will change or we'll be ready to change in future about it. And therefore, we should hold judgments. 
and final belief because who knows there is a scope of knowing something more in future so and you know if we keep the attitude of suspension of judgment we are more ready to know we are more ready to think we are more ready to adapt new things if we hold judgments if the bucket is already full with water there is no scope of putting or pouring more water so second school says that you yourself will keep changing what you believe today you may build this belief in future so you should keep on moving and should not be guilty avoid yourself being guilty about what you believed in the past and they both suspend judgments and be free this is mental equanimity and peace and move on the third school on the other hand with the same agenda wanted to say that they their approach of suspending judgment was slightly different from the first two schools because they prioritize avoidance of any kind of violence and suffering as one may have a fear of losing an ideological clash and being harmed in return now this school have sympathy towards to schools like jainism which maintain non violence as the very basic philosophy you know basis of their philosophy ahimsa similarly agyanvadan school the third school which was also also contemporary of all this buddhism and jainism and all other schools and the second and the first school of agyanvad believe that why we should suspend judgments we should suspend judgments because we want to avoid violence and suffering why because if we hold one belief and we try to question and reject others then what will happen there will be clash ideological clash harm you know most of the war fightings and if you see in history most of the wars have actually happened because of the ideological clashes so if you hold a belief and you are not ready to change it and in fact you become dogmatic about it which believing will make you to if you don't have a very precise and fine ways of learning you might be believing things which may not actually be right and what you then believe you believe them and you show others to be wrong because if you hold one thing to be true you have to hold the other to be false and but other may believe that false too and they may be clashing so the third school says that non violence is one of the very important key features to believe in suspension of judgments because that will help you to be non violent and will save you from clashes and ideological problems the fourth school on the other hand okay which i would like to focus a little more is by sanjay sanjay bilati putta he was a contemporary thinker of buddha and mahavir he was there very little is known about him he this fourth school he said that we should suspend judgment when he you know suspended judgment when he was asked about the purpose of suspension of judgment also so what what was sanjay school like the fourth school of sanjay is very different where if you see the school of piro okay the school of piro or piro you see the first and second and the third school all of them what is common among all of them they are all suspending judgments they are all holding that it is always better to withhold judgments and if you see they are giving a reason for it they are telling you why it is you should suspend judgments they are also telling you what you will get out of it you will get mental peace you will get mental equanimity sanjay was not like them like piro and others he said that perhaps to say that you should suspend judgments for mental peace mental equanimity all right some sort of well being it's also a kind of a belief again so he said sanjay bilbarati putra suspended judgment when he was asked about the purpose of suspension of judgment perhaps this was because to state a purpose also somewhere except some judgment that you must suspend ultimately so where all of the schools suspended judgments but they didn't suspend judgments on mental equanimity mental peace sanjay school suspended judgments on that also it said that if you ask me what do you get out of suspension of judgment he suspended judgments on that as well why because even to hold that that you will get mental peace could become an ideology could become a fixed belief system which he did not want it to because that would take away the method of suspension of judgment as the basis of life so he even did not tell the purpose of suspension of judgment and he again suspended it in fact i must tell you this virtue of sanjay is shown was was shown later in greek philosophy pyrrho when held that ataraxia is the best way of life he in fact was suspending judgments was but later got into a debate with other philosophers about what is the best way of life for example epicureans aristotle's aristotle's eudaimonia epicureans apophor you know apophosia 
and the democritus uh, you know uh, uh, atraxia and uh, the different meaning of atraxia by democritus all these schools also believe the well being of life and pero also through suspension of judgment suggested the well being of life and later all these schools pero and all other got into a debate about which is the best way of life so the whole purpose of suspension of judgment avoiding debate was defeated because ultimately they told the purpose pero told the purpose and he got into a debate so sanjay who was the, so belonging to the fourth school of agyanavad was very different from all other agyanavadins and even spironism he did not give the purpose for the suspension of judgment so if he was asked why you suspend judgments even suspended judgments on that so uh, this is philosophy if you see is a very different philosophy it it has a path but it doesn't it has a goal sometimes but some but in the case of sanjay's case it doesn't even have a goal even you have to keep moving on to wonder about what could be the goal and you may even if you have it you don't have to initiate it you don't have to make a school you don't have to create a system out of it which everybody should follow and then you will not be compelled to defend your views what happens participants if you notice when you hold a belief system when we hold a religion when we hold a ideology we are compelled to keep defending it keep saving it but in this case there's nothing to hold it's just a method perhaps we can it the question is not to reject any belief as you can see the method of suspension of judgment nothing is denied but nothing is accepted it is absolutely in neutral to everything moving on to the next slide i would want you to give the benefits of the suspension of judgment that pero all the four schools of agyanavad held and after this i would conclude my talk with showing the relationship between them which is philosophical relation i have already shown i'll also briefly very briefly talk about the historical relation so the benefits of suspension of judgment if you see are that suspension of judgment is a mental process or a method involving reason where mind withhold premature judgments and one can optimize these benefits with attitudes of ataraxia or mental equanimity so uh, you know peronists and agyanavadins thought that no matter how well you make a judgment it's always a premature judgment okay there like are many philosophers all philosophers think that we should not do mature judgment 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 we should think about before we believe something but they put a limit to it they think okay after these many steps we can believe something but peronians okay and agyanavadins didn't believe that they went to another level to say that you should keep on suspending judgments always because every judgment is actually a premature judgment so with this kind of judgments what are the real benefits of it one is the egalitarian approach as i understand it what is the egalitarian approach that all ideas can then be open to scrutiny and evaluation and that can permit to breed further ideas as we cast no hierarchies in thought before we fully understand them so if we do the suspension of judgment one benefit that we get is we have an egalitarian approach we don't look down upon any other belief we don't you know glorify or get obsessed with any beliefs or idea rather we entertain and evaluate all beliefs equally we are not biased towards anything there are no hierarchies and we therefore because we don't carry a belief we are and we are blank we are free we are liberal and we therefore can understand all sorts of beliefs without any biases or a prejudged approach so we have a the better form best form of egalitarian and free approach can be there according to uh, agyanavadins and pero if we if we follow suspension of judgment so if we care for egalitarian approach to entertain all ideas for learning we better suspend judgment then next is exploratory approach what is the exploratory approach as a benefit well if you suspend judgments you get the opportunity to go beyond one belief leading to a broader mindset any predication or determination implies negation when the moment we believe something the moment we hold something we negate the other for example if i say god exists then i am negating the idea that god does not exist suppose when i say if i if athe say god does not exist he is negating the idea that god exists so this is the problem with knowledge according to agyanavadin and pero that the moment you hold knowledge you determine something you predicate something you negate the other so knowledge is a very particular and a private and a closure activity knowledge doesn't increases your domain of knowing 
as other things rather it decreases because when you hold something to be true you have to make other things as false so exploratory approach cannot be met completely unless we suspend judgment or we hold judgment even if we think something we should keep it with us but only with a pinch of salt only then we can have a better broader mindset and we can avoid predication and determinism you know spinoza a great a very well known western philosopher spinoza said that all determination is negation so the more you know the lesser you know many philosophers have said that the third uh, gain that we have by the benefits of suspension of judgment as promoted by agyanavadans and pero is the skeptical approach what is this ideas accepted and imbibed may be true or false right and wrong good or bad that is they may have value from a considered frame of reference and from assumptions while they are argued for so suspending them from belief allowing us to see them beyond the frame of reference we can then question those references and alter our perspective suspension of judgment is prioritized over accepting or rejecting a judgment from me so what is the skeptical approach the skeptical word here simply means not to accept anything immediately so if you see if you see participants you will see largely we are caught up in the ideas or distinctions or dichotomies of true and false right and wrong good and bad all the time we are doing that now what skeptical approach is teaching us to that the perspectives the frames of references from which we see the world which we judge the world we understand the world themselves then can become the object of our study for example if you have a certain sort of an upbringing and you see the world through that upbringing your ideas if you having a philosophical approach of what pero and agyanavadins are teaching you will even take that as a scrutiny as an object of scrutiny that approach through which you see the world as a scrutiny so the knowledge of the world through which you see the world itself becomes a question of investigation so you keep holding things as good and bad right and wrong but through this method you will even question is there anything good in the bad in the first place because that itself become the object of study so skeptic approach is healthy because it allows you to you know not here skeptical doesn't mean doubting or rejecting here it means not to prioritize anything accepting or rejecting but to keep on investigating and lastly if you are suspending judgments you become more logical logical means you can see better relationship between things real relationship between things suppose for it or you can see a better sort of Uh, you know reasoning you can see better better reasoning developing in you very simple example that we can to make to understand that is suppose if a solar eclipse is happening okay we see a solar eclipse happening now some person may say it's happening because of moon's shadow or moon is because in between earth and sun but a person who is not knowledgeable will say that you know it's because of the sun is angry or the god is unhappy or we may give non scientific reason now logical approach is where we rather than saying that one is right or one is wrong we try to see relationship is moon is moon possible to be between sun and earth is is it possible for sun to be angry or happy that the eclipse is happening these kinds of questions are basically looking for right reason and Pyrrhonists believe, particularly as we don't have enough evidence from Agyanavadins. Pyrrhonists believe very clearly that if you are suspending judgments, you are better with seeing relationship between things because you don't carry belief systems already, which can alter your vision. You're not adulterated in your thinking, and therefore it says by suspending judgments, one avoids being judgmental and committing fallacies of faulty generalization. so in logic we teach a fallacy called faulty generalization which otherwise come up as prejudices and biases where we do not have enough evidence to believe in something and also another fallacy that we often commit when we do judge things is you know the fallacy of ad a uh, fallacy from ignorance we think that something because it cannot be proved to be true we think it is false and if something cannot be proved to be false we think it must be true we immediately jump to conclusions and judgments so having suspension of judgment approach saves us from lot of fallacy i am to read further where philosophers like peronian skeptics and agyanika which is the agyanavad held that if you believe something dogmatically and justify it then you face issues in entertaining beliefs that you do not believe 
and true wisdom lies in understanding an ideology without accepting or rejecting it so i conclude by saying that agyanavadans and peron has said the true wisdom does not lie in knowing or maintaining judgment or boasting that you know so much and not even rejecting things true wisdom lies in understanding what is happening understanding and investigating what is there without accepting or rejecting it so with this uh, i conclude and uh, i would like to thank all of you for you know uh, being uh, and for being here and for listening to me thank you so much Thank you, Sir Anish, for such an enlightening, enriching, and insightful deliberation. Right now, thank you so much. Uh, like we, as of now, we have one question, so we will be waiting for more questions. So now, I would just like to proceed with the second speaker, right? And then we will see the questions at the All end right. of the at the end of the talk of the. All right. So now, like before, I call Sir. Sandeep Biswas to deliver his lecture. I will just give a brief introduction about him. Uh, Sir Sandeep Biswas is a thinker of alternatives within continent within continental philosophy. He teaches philosophy at Northeastern Hill University, Shillong, India. He has presented papers in many national and international seminars, webinars, and conferences. He has authored numerous books, and his last published. Work is between philosophy and anthropology, apories of thought, language, and consciousness. Notion Press, Chennai, 2017. So now, sir, I will just. Sir, are you there? Sir, please take over. Sir, your voice is breaking. Sir, then please. Yeah, yeah. Can you hear me now clearly? One five. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, actually, I'm moving from library to the department. Can you uh, discuss for five minutes? You give me five minutes. I restart from my. All chamber. right, sir. Okay. So we will take the question. You can for see sir, me now. Background. Yes, okay. sir. Yes. Sir. I'm reaching my department room, and I'm going to start from there. You just discuss for two three minutes what the, the Mr. Anish was talking, just for two three minutes, and I I will start again from there after three All minutes. Right, okay. All right, sir. Okay, sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Anish, are you there? So we will take the questions for you. All right, and then later, if there are more questions, we will be presenting to you. Sure, sure. I can see one question here. Hello, sir Anis. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, so there is only one question. Um, so this attendee says, Stuart Mormon. So this attendee says, what do you think of inquiry uh, if one were to hold Peronian capticism uh, for to suspend judgment even on the level of basic belief, one is left with no direction at all on how to proceed in inquiry, for even making certain hypotheses would require to believe certain belief which is basic as true. It, if I feel wanting to say everything we conclude will be contingent and fallible, and another thing to affirm universally that everything will forever be contingent and fallible based on sampling reasoning, sampling reasoning. So what CS peers will call blocking the way of inquiry. So you want me to repeat the question or is it okay? No, no, thank you. I got the question, thank you. Thank you for asking the question. So uh, thank you for this question. I think it's a very interesting question and it will help me to explain the point that I wanted to make in the talk even better. Uh, 
just want to check once if I'm audible because my connection shows it's unstable. Am I yes, audible? Sir. Yes, sir. So, Anish, okay. this question is raised by Stuart Movin, a research scholar from Nehu, Ashla. All right. Thank you, Stuart. I can yeah, see it. Stuart, thank you. So, uh, see, uh, first of all, we have to understand one thing very clearly that in Pyronian skepticism, there, uh, there is no impetus or push towards not having, uh, you know, kind of understanding of things. There is a difference between believing something and there, uh, from that of understanding something. Yes, to believe something is, is uh, you know, important prerequisite to believe something is that we need to understand that thing or have some sort of cogn cognizance of that idea. So Pyrrhonian skepticism is in any way very much inclined towards understanding of things. In fact, if you see towards the end of my talk, I have actually pushed the idea that the more you the more you suspend judgments, in fact, the truth is that the more you're open to different ideas and openings of our beliefs, belief systems or thoughts that you can have. Now the theories that you have must be understood. Now nowhere that is questioned or challenged by pyrrhonism. What is questioned or challenged by Pyrrhonism is to bring those theories or views at the level of belief and opinions as you carry them in you. So to believe, to have, an, to have the understanding that there could be a God and to believe that there is a God are two different things. So we cannot, uh, as much as I can understand and respect your approach or question, I would say that it is never that we don't have any direction towards, you know, thinking or ideology. If we are not saying that if we don't carry even basic beliefs, how can we have a direction? The point is they will say that, yes, you can do, you can have a direction of inquiry. If, even if you don't have basic beliefs, why? Because you understand the theory. So uh, their sense of belief is not in sense of, you know, of theory, but their belief is in the sense of, accepting some reality or your personal idea. Granting it is a private space of thinking that you think it is acceptable to you. That is a belief. When you can justify it objectively, it becomes knowledge. So Peronians are not very comfortable with making you having a belief or having knowledge. Rather, they believe, take all knowledge and believe that you see as a thing to understand. So you have to, you can entertain all belief or theory rather than demarking them or making them as a belief or knowledge. So we have to understand normally, I know your question is very relevant because honestly speaking, any theory is a form of a belief. Any knowledge is a form of some sort of a system which humans believe. So just to briefly tell you, Peronians would be very careful or cautious of actually accepting that. They would rather make this subtle distinction between what you understand as an idea and what you believe about. So you can understand an idea without believing it. And therefore you can continue your inquiry into further investigation without keeping basic belief. But yes, one important prerequisite is that you must have understanding. And in fact, they think the more you suspend judgments, the better your understanding. So yeah, so thank you. Thank you, sir. I uh, think, sir. Uh, yeah, I, yeah. Thank you, sir Anish. Uh, Anish, uh, for for that answer, and I hope Stuart has got the answer to his question. So now I, sir, uh, sir Anish, we will be waiting uh, for. Uh, one. Uh, has professor, professor? I'm ready now. Right? Yeah, I think. Uh, sir, okay. sir, sir, do I have to introduce you again? Sure, sure. Yeah. All right. Uh, now, no, no need. You have already. All right, sir. So, so I'll like, speak now. Huh? Sir, I I'll will just. For, I'll speak for 20, 25 minutes. Yeah, please. Yes, sir. I will just uh, give instruction, yeah, uh, instruction go, to go the ahead. participants. Now, dear participants, if you have questions for both the speakers, please post your question in the uh, in the chat box, both in YouTube or in Zoom. All right. Thank you. So you can proceed. Yes, what are you talking about is called 
now now is it going on i'm speaking of the department yes sir now it's is it is it clear to you now yes sir okay okay so i'll keep the microphone near my mouth and i'm speaking can you hear me yes sir one five again yes sir again yes sir okay fine fine so what i am going to speak is a kind of sub discipline of philosophy which is called ethno philosophy and uh, philosopher polin honto had developed this particular terminology called ethno philosophy honto ji meant by philosophy of two things number 1 the way the members of an ethnic community do philosophy how they philosophize about their own world about their belief systems about their conceptual understanding of phenomenon of life and death etc it covers the entire world view of a community in its own conceptual terms so when a community does philosophy in its own conceptual terms in contemporary parlance that is called as nativism in 1970s when hontoji was using ethno philosophy one of the senses was nativist sense of doing philosophy the other senses something that is more universal if someone from the african community let's say from the bantu tribe is doing philosophy the way they are doing philosophy must conform to the generalized and the universalizable discipline of philosophy which is a kind of a standardized form of global philosophy so hontoji meant both nativism and globalism when he used the term ethno philosophy so ethno philosophy is not merely philosophy of an ethnic community but the way the philosophy of an ethnic community qualifies itself to be philosophy at the global level now this is where some kind of critical questioning happened the critical questions that arose is that western philosophers like hegel kant and marx have created the oriental african and asian societies as incapable of doing any philosophy in fact immanuel kant considered african and asian societies to be some kind of savage societies and savage societies cannot have a frame of understanding for themselves and this is what kant had argued in critique of uh, judgment in certain sections of critique of judgment he argued that savages can only go by their own stimuli the stimuli that they receive from the immediate surroundings these stimulus uh this stimulus speak certain concepts in their mind so the concepts that the savages have these concepts in no way can come near to universal concepts like good right truth beauty etc 
are the fundamental concepts in terms of which philosophy understands the world. So therefore, what Immanuel Kant was pointing out is that nativist concepts are fine, but nativist concepts are not such universal to qualify to be philosophical. Now, this is a point of contestation, which ethno-philosophers at a later stage had contested and questioned. Uh, the same mode of questioning involved questioning Hegel's notion of reason with a capital R, where Hegel believed that reason is something that is universal. Reason doesn't have a specific form which could be identified with a community or a locality or a region. Or a region. So region is something which is necessarily transcendent. So, so we cannot hear you muted yourself. Who muted? No, open. Hear me. You hear me? Yes, sir. Just now we could not hear you. Sir, we could not hear you. Yeah, we cannot hear you, sir. I have muted. I think. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Hello? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We okay. can hear you now. So, so I was. So I, I was arguing about Hegel's position that reason must be transcendental. And it is the transcendental form of reason, which means that the human subject would remain at one end. And on the other hand, there will be a conceptual framework within which the human subject would explain or harkness this in terms of which the world, the human subject can be known. So therefore the transcendental framework of reasoning, which creates transcendental concepts, concepts which are not nativist, but concepts which can provide a God's eye point of view on the life and the world in the surrounding of the natives, of the local people, that kind of a transcendental framework of reasoning is what philosophy is all about. And this is what was Hegel's idea. Now combining Hegel and Kant, one reaches to this position that nativist way of doing philosophy do not qualify philosophy as it lacks transcendence. There is a lack of transcendence in the nativist philosophy, because native philosophers speak to their own audience. They cannot speak beyond the context in which their philosophy is arising. And therefore, they are only representing their own tea, their own folk, and nothing to say to humanity. Since this uh, subtract accepting the native position from the universal. Also, this is abstracting from the native position certain conceptual frameworks that would, in an abstract way, represent the ways of understanding the world. So it is both subtraction and traction. Uh, uh, Gugi, uh, Gugi Toyin, Gugi Tiong in his colonizing the battle that uh, Sabe Nodavello talks about African philosopher 
that this kind of a neurocentric framework abstracts and appropriates the native as a common universal Western American white uh, and some such standard description of the human within which many of the native people and categories cannot be accommodated. For example, African people who belong to the black race, the Spanish and the South American who are Hispanics or Latinos and who are mestizos in a certain context and the Indians, the brown and the Mongoloid facial features, those who are otherized even in India as Chinese or Nepalese and not as Indians is a certain way of standardizing, universalizing the human with a byproduct this trans framework of that is supposed to philosophy. Now, as to both that, African thing pointed out that we need to nice this category human to uh, bring down the transcendental level of where the base of transcendence, the actual lives and actual experiences of it. So there you got the transcendental form of real could be altered and shared to the visual or to the social experiences of it. So therefore, nativist way of conceptualization. Yes, which is a conceptualization bottom up, you know, a kind of bottom up conceptualization where native categories, native concepts, and the native language not just represent, but it captures directly the immediate experience and allows an articulation, not in abstract ways, but in a concrete manner a certain experience of life. So it is possible to shift from the transcendental to the ground, to the bottom up way of understanding the world in terms of native concepts and categories. So this is how ethno philosophy reconceptualizes the way of doing philosophy, which is a radical alteration or a radical changeover to doing philosophy in a nativist way in terms of native concepts and ideas. Now, how could such a nativist philosophy uh, be implemented in the context of Northeast of India? And this is where I would take you to certain literature and certain ideas uh, which are very, very important for the Northeast of India. And one of the idea that comes to my mind is what Führer Hemendroff, who wrote this book, Return to the Naked Nagas, had written back in 1977. He wrote, I quote, Nagas have been subjected to many alien influences aiming at a transformation of their lifestyle. Why only Nagas, Kasis, Mizos, other tribal communities have been subjected to certain kind of processes to transform their lives completely. And then Anthony Giddens, famous sociologist, a British sociologist who had given rise to uh, new sociological rules in his writings, uh, talks about a change of rules from the tradition bound lives to the lives that are transformed because of alien influences that Fuer Hemendorf had talked about. Giddens says, 
In traditional societies, individual actions do analyze and thought about so much because choices are already prescribed by the traditions and customs. Whereas in post-traditional societies, we have to work out rules for ourselves. So what are these post-traditional societies? Post-traditional societies are those societies who carry their traditional identity in the cross currents of modernity and reaffirm their traditional identity with a kind of a syncretic or synthetic process of conceptualization. The syncretic and the synthetic process of conceptualization creates a match between the native concepts and the concepts that arose from the current uh, situations of life. Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, in the Aonaga uh, Perlins, you know, uh, okay, in the Aonaga Perlins, before they were converted to Christianity, you know, uh, they were believers of their traditional religion. But after they were converted to Christianity, you know, uh, they lost a certain way of uh, believing uh, their own gods. Uh, let's take the example of a god called Ayungpang Snungrem. The name of the god is Ayungpang Snungrem in, in Aonaga, literally translated as god of river bank. A god who is god of river bank. Sungkong is a certain form of uh, log drum. Sungkong is a certain form of uh, log drum that carries the blessings of the guardian deity, such as Ayungpang Shungrem. So this kind of log, log drum called Sungpong was used to communicate messages in times of emergency and festivities. And in true sense, for over many generations, it safeguarded all from many enemies home. There were different beat patterns, such as to communicate fire emergencies and danger of wild beasts, for events of enemy attacks, and for new moon and full moon. These drum bits were coded messages and could be understood only by the members of the village community. The rituals involved in curving the log drum and the importance they bestowed upon it thereafter became irrelevant to the teachings of the new Christian faith. And they thus started detaching themselves from it. Conversion to Christianity marks the decrease of Hong Kong activities that is managing through the log drum. Log, log drum. Less did the Ao realize that they were disposing one of their most striking specimens of handiwork, as anthropologist J.P. Mills commented on this changeover from the log drum to maybe communication through the church bells and by assemblies where uh, some kind of preachings can happen uh, instead of communicating through the log drum. Okay, so you can see that when log drum was abandoned, what replaced the log drum is a new kind of faith. And in the new faith that our community had, uh, had uh, accepted with the coming of uh, uh, with, the, with the late 19th century and uh, early 20th century, uh, messaging through log drum was replaced by replaced by some kind of church services. And in the church services, what has happened is that the Jesus Christ, you know, who is now the new Messiah, uh, substitutes the meaning of Lijaba. You know, Lijaba 
who is supposed to be set on in our language and in the traditional our religion, Lijaba was the one who used to decide how much one should be allotted of a ground reality or a situation. So Lijaba falls and gets replaced by Jesus Christ. So the character of Lijaba now changes into that of an angel, straight from being an evil, evil spirit to an angel. Lijaba becomes an angel in our Naga parlance with the coming of Christianity. Similarly, our Naga strongly believed that their moral character is determined by uh, a kind of a a kind of a moral quality, you know, which is called uh, sobaliba, a moral quality named as sobaliba. The more one has sobaliba, the greater one has this moral capacity, and 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 greater one has this capacity to remain away from immoral ways of life. Now, concepts like lijaba, concepts like subaliba, are concepts that create an ambience of distinguishing between what is good and what is evil. Concepts like lijaba, which are transformative concepts, transforms the concept of evil into concept of good. And concept like Subaliba sustains the concept of good in the life of the individual and in the life of the community. Although these concepts do not find any recording in the new faith of Christianity. So therefore, this kind of a uh, change is historically a kind of uh, colonial impact because the British annexed the Aulnaga territory in 1889 after overcoming several decades of resistance from the Angami Nagas in the south. So British wanted to enter, enter from the south of Nagaland from the side of Ko Kohima and Konoma where they experienced resistance from Angami Nagas. But in the Aonaga territory, when they went, the resistance was much weakened because they reached there at a later stage. Now, this memory of resistance you know, finds its expression in the form of Naga nationalism. And how this Naga nationalism had created a new sense of Naga identity uh, is another important question for an ethno-philosopher or for a nativist understanding of Naga identity. Um, quote from Mike Bridge, Mike Bridge, uh, and a famous uh, casting corporation reporter who quoted ground reality from Nagaland back in 19, back in 1997. And he's writing this. Few of the world's simmering civil wars have lasted as long as the conflict in Nagaland in northeastern India. It's a small but beautiful land of around a million and a half people. For the best part of 50 years since Naga leaders declared Nagaland to be independent, saying that as tribal people they had always ruled themselves. There, has, there have been an on-off war between militant groups and the Indian security forces. Now, now, what is this civil war all about? The civil war is all about expressing a distinct sense of self or a distinct sense of identity. And this distinctiveness of Naga identity cannot be captured by way of a transcendental argument which will reduce Naga identity within the broader rubric of a national or a global identity or a transnational identity. Now, Naga identity, even as a global identity or a transnational identity would become 
a certain kind of combination, a certain kind of juxtaposition between a traditional Naga notion of self, and as that notion of self articulates itself in the transnational and in the global context. So the way the Naga national self articulates itself in the global context is different from the way it articulates itself in the local context, because in the global context, Nagas had to express themselves as a distinguished self for which they have to mobilize certain elements of their faith, of their tradition, of their culture, so that they can garnish in a very specific way. Now I'm giving you this longish example of how changes have happened in India's Northeast under the colonial impact and later in the post-colonial times. But certain critical aspects of the community had remained and continued. For example, there is a sense of epistemic disobedience towards the dominant cultural framework of the West. And this sense of epistemic disobedience actually is expressed by way of reforming traditional lives and traditional worlds in which our tribal identities love to live and celebrate their own life. In fact, they, they create a collaborative reconstruction of their own inner life in the context of the modern global society. How that collaborative reconstruction happens? It happens through breaking away from the nexus of power relations that attempt to subordinate them as inferior, as marginalized, or as excluded. So there is a a conscious attempt of fighting back this process of exclusion that arises from the nexus of power relations or nexus of dominant power relations. So to break away from this nexus of dominant power relations, what is important is to recover a sense of free agency as being free agents or being the way they want to define and describe themselves as a distinguishable identity actually expresses the inner world of a particular community. And this expression of the inner world sets up a possible range of relations or possibility of casting a set of relations with others. And through this relationality with others, a particular community reconstructs its own inner self. But this relationality is not entirely reciprocal. It is highly asymmetric and sometimes one-sided. The way Nagas express about themselves, the modern contemporary world may not be ready to accept the expressions of Naga self. And therefore, what happens in the modern contemporary world is an act of boundary making. On the one side, there is an ethnic boundary. And on the other side of the ethnic boundary, there's an unfamiliar large world that doesn't easily recognize that ethnic boundary and how that ethnic boundary is sustained and maintained in terms of the tradition. But Assertion of an ethnic boundary itself is the mark of a post-traditional society because such assertions can acquire or give or rather attribute or ascribe a sense of distinctness to a particular identity which is there in a local context. Now, for example, let me give you how this ethnic boundary is assaulted by giving you a fascinating example from another tribe of India's Northeast, Manpas, who are supposed to be a very, very early ancient tribe, which is now 
are converted to Buddhism and Buddhist uh, manpas who are not Mahayana Buddhists, but Hinoyana Buddhists, those who worship a complete annihilation of their own body and the self, which Mahayana Buddhists do not do anymore because they believe in Nirvana and Hinoyana Buddhists believe in a certain kind of a certain kind of a transportation to uh, another world in order to change their current shape of being uh, without uh, necessarily be sure that they will have a new sense of body and being. So manpas are caught in a transition, transition from this world to the other world, another world which uh, is an unknown world, but nevertheless, the process of transition is known to them. Now, this process of transition is symbolized and acted out by way of cutting a dead body of the manpas into hundreds of pieces and then to float it in the river Tuanshu in Tawang district of Orunachal Pradesh. Tuanshu is a Himalayan river that meets the river Xiang, which is the river Brahmaputra. So Tuangshu is a tributary of the river Brahmaputra. And in Tuangshu river, which is supposed to be a sacred river that carries the cut pieces of the body of a dead manpa man or a woman, uh, takes them to the other world and it frees them from the incarcerated bodily consciousness of the living creature to release them into the material substratum of the river, which turns the body into the elements and the materials which arises from a post death or after life of the body or of the person whose body that is. Similarly, in Maunaga's story of origin, there are three brothers, Tiger, Spirit, and Men, who compete inheriting their mother's land, in which Men wins the contest by hitting the target with a bow and an arrow. This is a kind of an anthropocentric epistemy anthropocentric system of knowledge, which is not there among the Manpas. Manpas epistemology is an object-oriented epistemology, while Maunagas uh, understanding of origin of themselves in terms of a race between three different beings in which one being wins, goes ahead of other beings, and assumes the ownership of the earth to a hills in the hills where rivers flow, you know, those kind of hills. And these two communities are Tankuls and Meite community. The Meite community originates from the tiger, and the Tankul community originates from the spirit. And in the race between tiger, spirit, and the man, the man wins, and men lends up. Similar way, in the Kasi context as well, there is this very interesting race between five rivers, Ka Umtong, Ka Torasa, Ka Pasbira, Ka Jani, and Ka Dora. These are five sister rivers who all race together, the, together through the rocky terrains of Kasi Hills to reach up to the plains of Silet. And none of the rivers can reach up to the plains of Silet. The river that reaches the plains of Silet is this silken, silvery river called Umiam that flows down slowly by passing the rocky opposition and reaches up to the Silet plains. So, so you can see that there is a transhuman understanding of the human nature relationship. The relationality that I spoke about is not just an anthropocentric relationality, but the possibility of a relationality with nature 
is transformed into a tale about human lives. And the tale about human lives is also transformed into a tale about certain aspects of nature. Now, this mutual transformation that happens between the human and the nature and the imagination of the tribal self is something which most of the tribes share between themselves. How do they share this kind of transformation is an important question. They share these transformations by recalling what their ancestors have said that the ancestors have narrated such stories and the ancestors not only have narrated such stories as a one-off story, but the ancestors keep re-articulating, re-enacting these stories uh, when the present generation connects themselves to their ancestors in, by, way of, by way of conceptualizing the presence of ancestors in their home, heart, and any other public place. So most of the tribes of the Northeast, they conceptualize their ancestors to be present in their present current life. For example, Kasi's conceptualize Ka Yobwe as the pristine mother, pristine grandmother who is present in everyone's lineage. Every lineage starts with Ka Yobwe it refers back to Ka Yabui, and Ka Yabui is present. Uh, being the children of Ka Yabui, everyone remembers Ka Yabui and the clan relationship, you know, that happens uh, between the Kasis. And, and one has to know what are the clan relations and how a particular community is related to uh, other members of the clans. And this relationship is ritualized in the form of bamboo poles, in the form of collection of stones, in the form of erection of monoliths, and in the form of collection of bones of the dead, in the ossuaries that are maintained in the Kasi Jainti people's uh, villages. Uh, so you can see here a kind of free agency that connects the present generation of tribals with their ancestors. And ancestor worshipping is something very common across the tribal spectrum of the northeast uh, part of India. Uh, so the world is not construed only as a surrounding space, but it is a space in which present generation and ancestors are located at different heights so that the entire location now can be are uh, considered as the, as the habitat of the tribe. So within the habitat of the tribe, holistically, the ancestors, the relationality with others, the relationality with the optics of nature, the transformation of the human into nature and nature being transformed into human, all that happens together. And how that experience of happening is articulated by a community in terms of their ethnic boundaries uh, is also a question of territorialization and a question of deterritorialization as well. Because Kasis can see themselves traversing from Cambodia, emerging from Cambodia and coming to the present Kasi Hills. Nagas would see themselves emerging from Southwest of China and coming to a place called Makhel, which currently falls in the Nagaland Manipur boundary. So therefore, uh, a number of transitions, long journeys, and memories of the past get articulated in the present construction of an ethnic boundary. It's not simply a transcendental form of reasoning. It's not simply an inferential reasoning, but it is rather articulating an experience which is part of the memory in terms of how things are experienced today and how things have to be expressed in, in terms that are understood in today's context. So tribes then present themselves with something which is more than a gift of intellect and wisdom. And it contains a surplus of knowing which lies in the phenomenology of their world making. 
A very good example of this kind of wall making arises from Apatani concept of Kazum Koja, the lost civilization that is represented in the body of the hills above the Subansiri Valley of the present Arunachal Pradesh, which literally means counting the rib of the hills. How do Apatanis count the rib of the hills? Counting the rib of the hills is a transformation of the hills into, into personification of the human body. And this personification that happens in the consciousness is part of the kind of experience that they had about the nature, or also part of the kind of relationality that they develop with other human beings of their own tribe, as well as outside the tribe. And then they explain it, any other tribe, many other tribe explains it in this way, in terms of a naturalistic objectification or a naturalistic subjectification. A beautiful example that comes to my mind is about the Moon tribe of Northern Myanmar, who talk about Saib Lujmem, Saib Lujmem, literally meaning citing the veins of the mountains. So the Moon tribe cites the veins of the mountains, while the Patani tribe counts the ribs of the mountains. You can see the similarity. And in Jiliangrong and Tangkul Naga tribes, the main pillar of the house, Sanayumbi, uh, is, is invested with a certain kind of human carving supposedly signifying their ancestral descent. So therefore, this way of habitat making is something which cuts across the Northeastern community. The human figures, birds, etc., cetera, in, uh, in the Tankul houses called Talangkai or Ahungyum is something that represents a certain kind of humanization nature or a certain kind of representation of uh, optics of nature. And therefore, uh, Tankuls uh, classify their house types and their habitat types depending on what that house or what that habitat represents. For example, fence, not fence sum, the kind of house called fence sum represents the way birds make their nest and the way birds become part of the human folklore. Uh, another type of house called Fen Salaka Asari Maksha represents the way the world animals come to the human habitat and adopt to the human world themselves, as Tankul Naga stories tell us. And this kind of houses and classification of habitat can be still seen in villages like Oinam, Purul, and Pamota in Tamailong district of Manipur. Okay, so at the house of headman of Oinam, it was customary to curb not less than three tigers. And this tiger curving is part of this Fen Salaka Asari Maksa house type. And at Purul, not only at the headman's house, but almost all houses had one tiger curbed on the walls. That too, in life size. The headman would spend five days during the construction of a house without speaking a word, without taking food or wine. After this, he would spend another five days on wine, keeping respect for customary taboos. And the taboo is that tiger from where they originated in the race between man, spirit, and tiger. Tankul Nagas originated from tigers. So tiger become their principal motive in order to classify their own habitat and in order to make their houses in a certain way. Now, I gave the example of a type of house called Sian Lupui Kai. Sian Lupui Kai is the type of house that is built with women going around and dancing with eating discs in their hands. At the housewarming ceremony of this kind of 
Sian Lon Pui Kai House, House of Women, water is poured on the eating plates, and the women carry it around and dance. Hoi Kai is the house with Hoi shouts. When the women shout Hoi, the house changes its name. It becomes Hoi Kai house. Now you see these conceptual categories are native, but these native conceptual categories and the network of meaning that it creates gives rise to a certain kind of worldview, a certain kind of metaphysical relationality with the human being and the house that represents a certain imagination about the nature, about the surroundings. So therefore, uh, you can see that the nativist conceptualization has its own specific force. And this, uh, this uh, nativist force cannot be merged uh, in a kind of a blurring of distinction between the tribal world and the techno-scientific modern world. And therefore, the artifacts that makes a lot of sense in the tribal world and create a network of meaning as an act of giving meaning that begins from the secret of the symbols to how these meanings are spoken in the community in the form of a narrative or in the form of symbolization or in the form of a common practice is something that actually is an enactment of the very cultural logic of the tribal identity. So therefore, I don't want to uh, give you even more, uh, more examples, but just to conclude, I would say that the tribal notion of self has its own specific uh, understanding of the virtue and the moral quality of the self. In the Kasi context, we have this uh, word called karinu, karinu, which is supposed to be the core of the self, the core value of the self, and the core value that determines the moral qualities of the self uh, is something very specific to the Kasi world. In the similar way, in the Kukichin communities, which comprises of large number of tribes, the notion of Klo Maina is something very, very important that is available in Mizoram and the northern part of Myanmar across several communities. Uh, in, including the currents. Similarly, the Kasi notion of old clan, where Kasis are supposed to worship uh, the big serpent in order to uh, ensure their well being of the heart and family, uh, is also found in northern Myanmar among the, among the uh, uh, Polong communities who worship Kak Ia as the big serpent. So you have these similarities and travel of the concept of Kokia into the concept of Utlen, or travel of the concept of uh, Tlomaina into a concept of a genealogical understanding of, let's say, current belief in Yoa, which is the belief in the self, and in terms of which the quality of the self is assessed, uh, or the Jo belief in Pao, which is the specific self-identity, which is sacred, of a human body, which cannot be defined. Uh, therefore, uh, these kinds of notions, they crisscross across the cultural walls within the ethnic boundary and move across and create a sense of similarity, a sense of transmission, a sense of translatability between one ethnic community and another ethnic community. And the distance between the two could be a huge distance, yet, Concepts travel, and how the concepts travel is a mystery, a mystery that arises from the nativist way of conception of the self and the world. I think uh, with these words, I would sum up, otherwise I can go on and on. There are so many examples that can be drawn from the lives of the tribes of Northeast to understand their ethno philosophy. I stop here, uh, Dr. Wanfai, you can now take over. Hello, Dr. Wanfai, can you listen to me? Dr. Yes, Wanfai? Yes, sir. Yeah. sir. Yeah. Now you can take over from this. Right. So thank you so much. Uh, uh, thank you so much, sir, for such, uh, for your rich um,
insightful, interesting, and lucid explanation of ethnophilosophy and in exploration into tribal courts from Northeast India. We are the so we are grateful to you for demonstrating such an excellence and profound knowledge that you have gathered uh, from years of research and teaching. Uh, we are all inspired by your presence, sir, and I hope you will be joining us in the future sessions also. Thank you, sir. Uh, so we will check some questions if you have questions. Yes, yes, yes. Please take questions, I will be answering. Are you please see? Right. Yes, one for any question that. Yes, sir. Uh, no, sir. Like uh, on network, uh, also, it's not good. So, okay, here's okay. Your question. Sure. Uh, so, there is one question. Madam Pinky will ask the question. Sure, please, please. So can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Please go ahead. Uh, so there is one question for you. Yes. Uh, this question is from Sir Breckbell Marco. He is an assistant professor in um, Dumbosa College, Tura. Uh, so okay. his question okay. is, what is the real point about afterlife of the tribals of Northeast India? Correct. Uh, yes. So do I answer this question or I take a few more questions? Uh, yeah. Do I answer it directly? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So it's a good question. The afterlife and the present life are not really distinguished in the tribal worldviews. In most of the tribal worldviews, the present life continues to the afterlife and the spirits that are relevant in the present life continues to the afterlife. Uh, but in the afterlife, the space of meeting the ancestors is widened. Uh, you can think about the Kukichin community. They think that Lake Riddle, which is on the south of Mizoram and inside Myanmar, you know, is the lake of dead, dead souls. And it is on the banks of the Lake Riddle that there is this old, oldest, the oldest banyan tree from which the Kukichin communities have arisen as a kind of belief. So it is the belief system that takes them to a reference of the spirit which pervades the afterlife. And in the afterlife, it is some kind of an opening towards the ancestors. So it's a kind of a relationality that extends beyond the, beyond the present life and goes to the afterlife and involves the ancestor. But this involvement of the ancestor happens through a certain embodiment, embodiment through a lake. For example, in the Garo context, <coughs> you have this uh, land of dead souls, Balpakram. Uh, every soul goes to Balpakram and once in a while, you need to go and propitiate the dead souls in Balpakram. So the afterlife that takes you to a heavenly place, that takes you to the higher order of the world, uh, arises in a kind of a continuum from the present life to the afterlife. And the idea of death as a disruption between the present life and the afterlife have not been there in the traditional tribal societies. Death looked upon as a, dis as a discontinuity, as a point of disruption arose from the modern worldview, which has not been there in the tribal worldview. So therefore, tribal worldview assumes a continuity between the present life and the afterlife, where one goes and meets the ancestors and lives with them happily forever afterwards. Okay, so that's the answer. Thank you, sir. But, sir, it was very interesting. Thank you. Hello, sir. Can you hear me? Yeah. 
Can you hear me, sir? Yes, I can hear you. Please go ahead. So the next question, uh, next question is for you is, so what will be the course of this ethnic philosophy or views of the Northeast region? Will the future deteriorated or will be on the rise again? Mm. So it's, it's continually on the rise. You can look at the case of Naga nationalism. You know, Naga nationalism is able to articulate a global Naga diasporic identity. And it is not only the Nagas, but the other tribes also who can look back at their point of origin. And most of the tribes have originated from the Sino-Tibetan region, which uh, James C. Scott, in his famous book on uh, Jumias, uh, coined this term called Zumias. And the Jumia society is a society which is on the move. And this moving society is placing itself at the higher altitude, at the highlands of South Asia. And as they place themselves at the highlands of South Asia, they create a sense of being a non-state society. Now, what is happening in the globalized world? The boundaries of state are collapsing. And in fact, the state systems are undergoing into such a crisis that they are looking back at a more primordial form of life, giving rise to identity politics and violences. Now, without taking that kind of a course, the tribal societies are able to articulate a worldview based on their location at the high altitude, at the higher planes of uh, the world, from where they can look at the world in a much better way with a holier and holistic perspective than people who are at the lower level. Uh, now, now, this is a kind of a cognitive difference between people who are highlanders and people who are midlanders and people who are downward and who are in the plains. So there is this classification possible in terms of world uh, worldviews. Uh, that's very, very fundamental. Secondly, uh, which is more important, is the search for identity. In the search for an authentic identity, two things are happening simultaneously. At one level, ethnic boundaries are becoming more and more rigid. At another level, people are crossing these boundaries and they are trying to become more and more global and cosmopolitan. The global and the cosmopolitan culture is finding a place within the ethnic boundaries as well. So it's a kind of a complex process of appropriation, articulation within one's location, and again, re-articulation by addressing the challenges that one is facing uh, in a certain point of time. So, so you can see all these processes are simultaneously happening in the lives of tribal communities of India's Northeast. Right? This is what I wanted to say. Thank you, sir. Okay. So the question was from, was from Sri Prakash. Okay. So now like, uh, we have, like, sir, uh, sir Adi, she just want a clarification of question. I really don't know. But oh, he, you sir you Adi, you. the one who is, uh, who is the speaker. Yeah, yeah, let him speak. Let him speak. No, yes. sir. sir, Anish, you can ask, uh, uh, you can see the clarification from sir. Okay, okay. Uh, but you can, yeah. Yeah, sir, sure. I just have this question, uh, just sure. cla small clarification. Sure. Uh, I wanted to know that uh, uh, where do we put ethno philosophy into uh, when we talk about it being as a subfield of philosophy? I mean, is it uh, taxonomically? or understandably different from regional subfields like Indian philosophy, Greek philosophy, or Chinese philosophy, because these are regional philosophies. And ethno-philosophy also, in some sense, talks about the uh, indigenous or the cultural philosophies of some places. So do we yes. place it as a separate field, or do we count it as one of the subfields, like we have Indian, Greek, or Chinese philosophy? Thank you. Uh it's a, it's a kind of a uh, it's a kind of a transition that is happening through ethno philosophy ethno philosophy is questioning eurocentrism it is questioning the dominant modes of knowledge 
And therefore it is questioning uh, some of the dominant canons of Western philosophy. And while questioning the dominant canons of Western philosophy, it is trying to look for alternatives that are emerging from the native life worlds in terms of the native concepts. Uh, now these concepts that are coming from the native life world uh, can be interpreted you know, in an anthropological sense, in an ethnographic sense, in a cultural sense, in a linguistic sense. So all these ways of interpretation connects ethnophilosophy to certain philosophical methodologies. It could be analytic methodology, it could be phenomenological methodology, depending on which way one is trying to interpret and build up a system of theory, theorization based on these concepts. So therefore, uh, taxonomic classification is something that is little canonical. And we may have to think outside the canonical way of classification. We may have to yield a separate space, a space which is interrelated and a space which is not necessarily part of an epistemic hierarchy. Uh, rather, it's a kind of a separation, a differentiation, a kind of a, uh, a, a, kind of a uh, differentiated articulation uh, that requires a, a totally new and a very, uh, very, very, uh, I would say, a very novel kind of an approach, which will be innovative. And at the same time, uh, it will carry the entire burden of philosophical canon uh, in order to renew itself into something that is very novel in terms of interpretation and understanding. So therefore, it's a separated space, a space which is distinguishable, a space which defies taxonomy, a space that challenges the dominant mode of articulation of knowledge, and at the same time, yearns for a space for itself, which could be articulated in its own terms. It's a kind of an autonomous space outside the dominant canons of philosophy. And at the same time, as it, as it takes a place outside, it is not denying what happens inside the canons of philosophy as well. Okay, Anish, so this is very uh, interesting and evolving in a sense. Well, thank you, sir. I think uh, the book that you have also uh, written, I think I was doing some research. I saw this book by you on ethnophilosophy already there. I think uh, that would be a fine read to even get more understanding about it. So thank you, sir. Oh, welcome. Welcome. You are welcome. So, Dr. Wanfai, next. Yes, sir. Yeah. Sir, so, like, Stewart have a question? Yes, sure. Uh, he is not here, but he wrote to me. Like okay. how to make philosophical conversation possible between two different forms of life in case of conflict of belief? Yes, and that's a very relevant question, actually. Now, uh, one answer that comes is from Amartya Sen, who has been dealing with this conflict of beliefs and values. Now, conflicting beliefs and values have to be driven towards a certain kind of a dialogue. And this driving them towards a dialogue to find out a common place for them is a philosophical and a political work. So simultaneously, we have to conduct this political philosophical work to bring together the conflicting belief systems and conflicting value systems to emerge into a kind of an exchange uh, or to come to an in-between space a space of negotiation and mediation, without which uh, the conflicts would go on and no conflict can go on forever because uh, conflicting belief systems cannot, can go in a diametrically opposite direction, but this slide will not lead to uh, a kind of a total separation and diffraction. Rather this slide towards difference uh, also have to meet halfway what it is different from. And that's how the systems of ideas evolve. And therefore, uh, conflicting belief systems uh, is a kind of an initial point, which gets transformed into a more human, a more harmonizing impulse of meeting each other and struggling with each other in the form of a reciprocal recognition. 
as it happens in human history. And this kind of a historicization is always possible by taking a plunge from conflicting belief systems. Uh, that's what I would tell Stuart um, in response, yeah. Yeah, Dr. Wanfai, can you yes, hear sir. me? Yes, So we don't yes. have any more questions, sir. Uh, right. Yeah. Right, yes. We don't have any more questions, sir. Fine, fine. That's yeah. okay, uh, yes. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Yes. It, it was such an enlightening and interesting lecture. Thank you. So, uh, Wanfai, I take your leave. Uh, my best wishes to Dr. Bivan, your principal, and to you and to fellow colleagues and everyone in the Don Bosco College. Thank you so and much, to, sir. And to fellow speaker, Anish. Um, I'm very fond of him otherwise, so uh, my, uh, my good wishes to him. As Thank well. you, sir. Thank you. It was a pleasure to share platform with you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. You are most welcome. So, Dr. Wanfai, I'm taking leave of you now. Yes, sir. All right, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye, sir. Bye. Uh, so, now we have come to the end uh, of... Oh, sorry. So, now, like, uh, I will call, sir. I will request, sir, Perik to propose the word of thanks. Hello everyone, can you hear me? So good afternoon everyone to the one and all present here. Our honorable speakers, Mr. Anish Chakrabarti and Dr. Prasenjit Viswas and all the participants. It is such an honor for me to get the opportunity to thank you all the dignitaries on the behalf of the philosophy department Don Bosco College Tura I extend a warm welcome to the people in the gathering. I would like to express my gratitude to all the esteemed participants of the webinar for their presence and the contribution to make this webinar a great success. I extend my gratitude to our honorable speaker, speakers, Mr. Anis Chakrabarti, Assistant Professor, Department of Philosophy, Kamla Nehru College, University of Delhi, and Dr. Prasenjit Biswa, Associate Professor, Department of Philosophy, Northeastern Hill University, Shillong, to take out time from the busy schedule to be the speaker on this very event. Thank you for inspiring and encouraging us with your enlightened words on this special day. Uh, special thanks to our uh, Father Vivan Mukim Rodriguez, Principal of Don Bosco College, for providing immense support to make the webinar successful. I extend my gratitude to Dr. Wan Fai Mary K. Japan, HOD of Philosophy Department, and Ms. Pianki Murak, Assistant Professor of Philosophy Department. And I want to thank uh, our students, Mr. Dekum Seth Marak and Mr. Anurag Kopcha for selecting out the equations at this very time. And I must thank our uh, Sir John Satish and Sir Jevlin Sangma who have helped us with this technological system. I must thank the organizing team volunteers for working hard for the first few days to make this webinar successful. Last but not the least, I want to thank all the participants for their active participation. Thank you, everyone, once again, for thanking, uh, for making it a great, a great success. Thank you. Dear participants, you can fill the feedback, uh, the feedback form, uh, and the, the link will be active till eight o'clock at night. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, and we are. Uh, we wish that you will be joining us again in the next session. Thank you, Dr. Van Pai. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sir Anish. Thank you, Dr. Van Pai. Thank you very much. And especially thank you. Thank to, uh, thanks to the principal, Roger Hughes Mukim. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, madam.